All right, so it's Rosh Hashanah, fulfillment timing. You know, there's two problems with getting into prophecy. The first one is people are proud almost. They wear a badge of honor. You know, I don't look at prophecy. That is divisive. Um, it can't be ascertained. And um, so, you know, I'm, I go with Jesus and I go with the gospel. That's all we need. <laughs> Shame. Um, and it's pretty arrogant, really. And, of course, it ignores the fact that the, God took the time through the prophets to write about a third of the scriptures as prophecy, which we then say, no, we, that would be about, say, roughly 10,000 verses spread over the prophets, Jesus, and so on. Um, that's a bit of an error. But on the other side, you've got Harold Camping and others that say, I know, I know the day, <laughs> I know the hour. And also they, they get consumed with prophecy. And uh, so you've got the road all the time and you've got to ditch one way and a ditch the other way. It's like law and grace. If you go too far with grace, it becomes licentiousness. If you go too far with the law, it becomes legalism. Both of them, very serious issues. And uh, it's all about following Jesus, which is the narrow path. And uh, so it's the same here, Father. I I'm trying to tread a narrower path, uh, but clarifying some things that come up uh, quite frequently now in our environment you know what about this thing the Shemitah what about this what about that so what I'm doing with you this morning <clears throat> is I'm sharing my thoughts with you so I'm not proclaiming dogma you must decide what you but you know I don't know everything about God does anybody know anything about God well I actually preach about God you know and I don't know everything about Jesus but I preach about Jesus I don't know everything about a passage that I'm doing, but I, pre I preach as best I can. So that's what I'm doing now. It's not dogma. I don't know it all. But I, I feel it's wrong to have quite an important topic, and I know what I think, but you don't know what I think. So I'm just sharing it with you. Is that okay? That's what we're doing this morning. I'm sharing. Let's see how it goes. It's going to be quick. So there's seven appointed times of God in the Scriptures. They come from Leviticus 23. Uh, the th thing that heads up this list, of course, is Shabbat, which we discussed the other evening, so we're not going to get into that. Uh, the Sabbath, very, very important as it is. Um, but nevertheless, they are, I'm going to ignore the Hebrew and go with the common names that we would have in the Gentile world. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, Day of Atonement, and tabernacles. God gave the Jews these times, the date, a calendar. Uh, before they even came out, of Egypt they had a calendar a born-again calendar and a spiritual calendar and uh, it starts with the cross and it ends at the kingdom and in other words when you look at it in the big picture what are these feasts doing they're outlaying the end from the beginning as God says you can test me I tell you the end from the beginning and of the redemptive acts of Christ on earth so those feasts have group and individual patterns. The group gives us the entire restoration plan, but individually, each of the themes of the individual feasts, uh, God has patterned them with the Jews to go through these appointed times on certain calendar timings, very specific, and uh, to repeat in patterns aspects of the feast, which really if they only knew, are aspects of the Messiah whom they didn't recognize when he came. And uh, they are aspects of God's redemptive plan in total, universally. And uh, I must tell you a peeve I have, uh, which is, uh, you know, some people will, if, if it's Jewish, it's good. It's rubbish. If it's Jewish, it's good. It's not true. You've got to work out, does he know the Lord? If he doesn't know the Lord, he's got a veil over his eyes straight off. Straight off, he's got a veil over his eyes. He doesn't know the Father. Jesus has disconnected him, and you need to be praying for him and working for this person, not listening and sitting at his feet. That's a ditch. On the other hand, you go over the other side, and people ignore everything Jewish, everything Old Testament. We have entire segments of the church that don't even look into the Old Testament. So That's the other side of the ditch. Just make sure again, we're on the narrow road of balance. So there's an agricultural patterning to these feasts, as you saw. There's a historical pattern because there are historical events for each of the feasts. And there's a prophetic pattern to each of the feasts 
because uh, we will see as we engage a little bit more that every aspect of the feast is prophetic about Christ and his redemptive plan. And uh, when we go into the details of the feast, which we're not going to do this morning, we see lots and lots of patterns of Christ hid hidden, as it were, inside the feast details. And... Uh, we find our discipleship in these feasts. <laughs> if you actually study the feasts properly, you'll see they give you a plan of discipleship. And this is my Father God, this is your Father God, this is the God of the Scriptures. He's much wiser, cleverer <laughs> than anything that we can imagine. And deeper than what I'm even telling you today, I'm sure, absolutely. But notice he's telling us one set of things in a text. And from that text, you can get an agri agricultural patterning, historical patterning, prophetic patterning, Messiah patterning, and discipleship. <laughs> He's a marvelous God, and that's just scratching the surface, I'm sure. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? He's marvelous. So there are these seven appointed times. What do they mean in terms of Christ? Passover is his death exactly to the day. Understand when Passover to the day and the hour when they were killing the lamb and the priest was killing that lamb, not just on the day, but three o'clock. On the other side, Jesus was dying at three o'clock on the same day. He's the real lamb, the lamb that the other patterns had been patterning for 1,500, roughly, years. And he's there. And these poor people cannot see it. After 1,500 years of patterning. And this is a lesson to us that we must make sure that we're not just seeing something and seeing something and seeing something and we're not getting it. If they can be blind to things, we can be blind to things. <clears throat> There's his burial, the unleavened bread. He was in the, uh, in the ground for the period of that uh, feast, which shows, again, that he was... Uh, he, I don't believe he died on a Friday. I hear lots of excuses about that. I per personally much prefer he died on a Wednesday. Three days and three nights, exactly as he said, Jonah, in the whale. First fruits, the resurrection, when the priest was waving the fruits, literally, in, in terms of their festive process, at the time he's doing that, I don't have any doubt at all, Christ is rising from the grave. The first fruits of the resurrection for us, praise God. Pentecost, 50 days later, Jesus sends his spirit down while the people are up in the upper room. And we've got, oh, whoopsie, and we've got uh, trumpets, taking of his bride, Day of Atonement. He's going to return as king. He's going to set up a new world order. Obama and co. and the UN and whatever, they can try all they want. You read your Bible, there's going to be attempts to a new world order. They're going to set up new world order organizations and military and whatever, but they're not going to achieve it. While they're in the middle of trying to achieve that, the king of kings and the lord of lords and the supreme king of the universe is going to come down and sort everything out. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just for those who might not understand, you need to understand he's not waiting for the church to do anything. He's waiting for Israel to do something. He's waiting for the generation that will not be like the evil generation that, that was conspired together to reject him. But he's waiting for the generation that's going to say we were wrong and are praying for him and it's going to bring him back. And he's going to sort of say, why did you take so long? Okay, he's waiting for them. As we're trying to, you know, half, well, 90% of the church is going, Israel's irrelevant. <laughs> These poor people. <clears throat> not according to Jesus, not according to the word, not according to the prophets. Then tabernacles is the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. First coming of Christ has happened. The first four feasts all happened on their days. So, will the, is God going to ignore the last three feasts? You must be joking. So, the spring feasts have been fulfilled, and uh, yes, that's right. What do they mean to us? Passover is our new birth, coming out of Egypt, our Egypt, coming out of our spiritual Egypt. Unleavened bread, putting off our old man. We were actually, Kevin spoke about that this morning. Putting off the old man, the most key spiritual lesson you can ever be given. We put on the new man, first fruits. That's what's happened to us. 
That's a, that's a positional truth. It may not be your experience in your life, but positionally it is true and you would have to take scripture and cut it out of your Bible to make it untrue. It is there in your scriptures. Pentecost, be filled with the spirit of power. And uh, so in between the two groupings, what, what are the Jews doing in their agricultural system during the period of our church age? They're out there doing the fruit harvest. The church age. And uh, then there's trumpets, the rapture of the church. Uh, I should mention it's got the new moon. That is why that is the time when no man can know the day and the hour. Because it's the only feast you can't know the day and the hour of because it's two days. Talk a little bit more about that later. But that's why you cannot know the day and the hour. It's a new moon. It has to wait for a new moon. But it's not waiting for a NASA to tell us when it knows the new moon is there. It's got to be very specific. You've got to be in a specific place in the temple, in a specific part of where the temple was, looking up, two witnesses, and you've got to see the new moon. Then you've got to identify it down with the Sanhedrin. They agree with it, and then they send out over fires, all over, they passing the message with fires all over the land and even into distant lands as best they can. It started. That's why they have it over two days. That's why God did it. <laughs> because what does it mean? No man knows the day or the hour. No man. No matter what system and theory they've got. No, no, they don't. They don't. The Day of Atonement, the door of salvation closes. Christ is going to come back on what day? Day of Atonement. Can we get saved then and say, whoopsie, I made a mistake? Too late. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be a terrible time. Tabernacles, uh, after Jesus has cleaned things up, uh, we're going to go into a thousand year reign. People are going to come down with Christ from the wedding. Uh, down will come the Old Testament saints. On earth will be the believers who've, who've gone through the tribulation. Uh, those who were martyred will be coming down and it's the biggest party and celebration ever held. It's going to make our little Shabbat. <laughs> Can you imagine? So the sort of patterns, historical events, you know, that was a pattern I said to you. Yes, Israel came out. That's a fact. It was historical. By faith in the blood of the unblemished lamb. The messianic for fulfillment was the death of Jesus, the lamb of God on the tree. And uh, spiritual application, as we mentioned before, unbeliever repentance towards God and faith in the shed blood of Christ. For those who think you have to repent before you can be saved, you've got to cry and know all your sins and you've got to be in a weeping mess on the floor. Uh, there's nothing about that with them, is there, in that pattern? In that pattern we go back there, didn't it say, okay, you Jews, you've been ignoring me so long, so look, before I put this blood on, the, you've got to, I need to show everybody the pattern. You need to get on your knees and be weeping and repenting of all your sins so that you can be good enough that in my grace I will save you. No, that was all grace. Nobody earns anything with God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nothing. We go to before God with nothing. Nothing. And he gives us everything. Praise his name. Praise you, Yeshua. Christ is going to come to take his church to heaven. John 14, 1 to 3. This is the main proof text of the rapture. Don't let your hearts be troubled. He's speaking to his disciples who represent the church. Believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If you were a Jew and you were spiritually aware and you were reading these words, you would know immediately that Jesus is talking to you in terms of the ancient Jewish wedding practices. Exactly. The fundamentals of the practice. And uh, so you would know immediately, you'd be able to put two and two together to begin, okay, so the groom and the bride, they make a covenant. Oh yes, that's like us. And uh, the groom has to pay a price for the bride before they marry. Oh, that's Jesus on the cross, yeah. And so we go on and on and on. So it's a teaching on its own. We're not going to go, I'm just alerting you to the fact that when we read this, you would read immediately, we've got a pattern Related to him coming back for his bride, he's coming back for his bride, like the groom would, 
What does the groom do in the ancient wedding? He goes to his father's house. That's where he went. What did he do? He went and built a place for his wife to stay. Oh, then what happened? Well, no, the, the, the woman, the bride, stayed away. She didn't go with him. She waited. Okay, till when? She didn't know. She wasn't told. When did he come back? Did he send her a letter and say, I'm coming? No, he came at night. And what else did they do? Oh, no, they blew a trumpet as they're advancing in. And what else did they do? Oh, no, well, they took a friend. Oh, a friend of who? The groom. And the groom gave the friend to the bride. Why? To help the bride prepare. Oh, you mean like the Holy Spirit? Exactly like the Holy Spirit. Exactly like, not slightly like, totally like it. Got, got the gist? So we stop that. But just to give you the gist there. Now, when you read and study more than we're going to do this morning and you begin looking at the Feast of Trumpets and you look at the ten different names of Feast of Trumpets given by the Jews, not by Christians, not by me you begin to see the names are coming down and they're describing the components of the wedding clearly, absolutely clearly they're describing the same thing it's amazing God is amazing so exactly according to the ancient Jewish wedding. Okay, that's great. So that's the rapture. It's according to the Jewish wedding. And then when I looked at trumpets, I found out, the Feast of Trumpets, that, uh, well, logically, given that the Christ has got to come for his church and the tribulation would either follow or be very close to that, to the end, then it should be happening soon. Yes, that's the next feast. He's coming for his bride. If you don't like it, get over it. Listen to the word and go with the program because it's God's program and it's going to happen. And uh, so, okay, so, and uh, this is patterning it when Jesus, what was Jesus doing technically here again? He was giving the groom's farewell speech to his bride exactly according to the Jewish customs. He would stand up having done their covenanting and their promises and by the way, he gave us a covenant New Testament, that's your, that's your what is called the ketubah. That is your wedding agreement. In there you find everything the groom said he'll do for you. And he says, if you love me as my wife, I've told you what I'd like you to do. I'm not going to make you do it, but I'm going to send my friend and he's going to encourage you and open you up. If you're open in the spirit and you release the hardness of your heart, you'll learn how to love me. And it will be good. <laughs> and there will be peace and there will be joy. So, but when? Can we get any more accurate? Yes, well, we could. Yeah, I've given that some thought last night. <laughs> banging away on the computer. Um, yeah. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you. This is Paul the Apostle speaking. The Thessalonians. And how you turned as pagans, from idols to serve a living and true God. Then what were they told to do? And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Okay, so there's, we can argue what the wrath is, but we know there's a wrath coming, and Jesus is going to come, and they must wait for him to come. And we can also see, Paul didn't say, don't do this yet because it's another 2,000 years. Paul was open to the idea that it could be any time, right? But we're going to see any time qualified. Any trumpet's time. <laughs> any trumpet's time. Any time, but any trumpet's time, in my opinion. Okay? What else? Anything else? Yeah, we know that it's going to happen before the day of the Lord has come. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4. We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him for his bride, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure. Don't be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The Thessalonians had been told by false teachers that they were in the tribulation. They were suffering tribulation and false teachers were going around saying, Paul said, you're in the tribulation. And he's putting to bed, that is not true. For Paul to do that, it means Paul knew that there were certain things that you could recognize about the tribulation. Right? Makes sense. 
Otherwise he, he could say, hey, maybe we're in the tribulation. He's not. He's categorically saying we are not in the tribulation. So in other words, what that means is Paul knew there are certain things you must see or know before the tribulation can happen. So let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Well, that would be a falling away from a position of faith. And uh, when we look at the churches, we go back to Luther and Calvin and we see the sort of a, what we call the Reformation. And uh, we saw uh, much missionary activity going. So the church was uh, sort of flourishing in a funny way, not entirely. But uh, it, was, it was certainly flourishing in terms of the previous uh, ages where the Roman Catholic Church were dominating things. And... Uh, so, but since then, of course, we've seen this apostasy, which was predicted. We, it's another thing we can bring into a possible presentation is to show people a bit of church history and show this apostasy. And we're in the apostasy age, the period of the Laodicean, the seventh church that Jesus described in Revelation. We are in that seventh completion church. Seven is a, when used spiritually, is a number of completion so it won't come unless apostasy comes first. Well, we're seeing that. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So it's saying it won't come until the, unless, uh, now what is it saying won't come? It's not saying the rapture won't come. It's he's telling them the rules for the tribulation won't come, right? Make sure we understand what's being told here. Paul's telling them, they were telling you are in the tribulation. I'm telling you, those things have to be first before the tribulation. Right? Not before the rapture. Rapture and the tribulation are not under the same conditions. They're not linked in conditions. Do you understand what I'm saying? One can happen outside the conditions of the conditions that he's just said for the tribulation. Does that make sense to you? Right? So in other words, the rapture happens under certain conditions when Christ is coming and it'll be on a certain period of the year. And the other thing is the tribulation that these people were confused about and Paul is saying this day of the Lord has to come before the tribulation comes. And uh, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. So he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Some people spiritualize this and say this is uh, him sitting in the church or in people's hearts and so on. And there's no reason uh, the Antichrist cannot be operating in that spirit within the church. But this is talking about a real temple and a person uh, doing the patterning that we've seen with Antiochus Epiphanes, that we've seen with Titus and the Romans, where there is a real temple and he's gone in that temple to the Holy of Holies and defiled it, calling himself God. This is going to happen. There's going to be a temple. When again? Another scripture passage, John 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself. Jesus is talking to Peter, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Peter actually asked to be um, crucified upside down. He didn't want to dishonor Christ. Now this he, that's Jesus, said to Peter, signifying what kind of death he would with, with which he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to, to Peter, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, following them. There's a little bit on the verses, but for speed. Verse 21, so Peter, seeing John, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him in reply, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Don't worry about the other person. And that's how we should be when we worship, when we pray. We shouldn't worry about other people. We just worry about our Lord and how he's leading us. Verse 23, therefore this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple, John, would not die. But Jesus didn't say that to him, that he would not die. But only, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? What's the point of this? The point is, when you look at that, Jesus is inferring, if I want him to remain or not. In other words, he's, he's giving the possibility that he could come at an indeterminate time. What is it to you? What I do with him. 
coming. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's opening up. Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't invent nonsense. He could come. Remember though again, even if he came, what is it to you if I came? I am suggesting to you, even if he had come at that early time to rapture the church, which he wasn't going to do, but even if he had chosen it, because remember, why would Jesus have to leave it as an open option? I'll tell you why. Because Peter was going to come out of the upper room, come down and pray to, to the Jews, thousands of them, and tell them about this Christ they killed. And 3,000 of them came to repentance and belief, right? About 51, say, 50, 51 days after Christ has risen from the dead. Right? So there's the thousands of them. What's in the speech that Peter's giving these people? He wants them to repent. Why? Because then God would restore. You see, he's talking about a promise of restoration. What's this restoration? Hey, as soon as you guys get your act together and say we all repent and we shouldn't have killed you, he's coming back. So in other words, Jesus in these passages is allowing the possibility, logically, correctly, quite correctly, that there really was a choice and they really could have done it and they could have brought Jesus back a month later, two months later, three months later, a year later, 500 years later, a thousand years later, 2,000 years later, and he's still waiting, but he tells us, I'm going to make them call on me. I'm going to put them in a tribulation like they've never seen. I'm going to take the church out and they're going to see the websites that they already know of because they are arguing with us all the time about it, which is good. And they seem to, they're getting more and more aware of the Christian message in order, because they want to defend it. So they've got to research us to see how they can defend it. Brilliant. Keep researching. Keep going, boys. Because there's going to be a church moving and you're going to start seeing these events that you saw in the book of Revelation that you were denying and then you're going to turn. Eventually. Not day one. They're too, they're too stiff-necked like us. No, stiff-necked. They're going to go seven years before they call on the name of Christ and he's going to come. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so this, these, this little passage gives us the idea that probably it could be the Feast of Trumpets. Now we're ignoring what I told you about the marriage. So pretend I never told you that. So we didn't know that and we're reading this passage. And it says, uh, from Paul, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, dead, physically dead, so that you won't grieve as do the rest who have no hope. We should be going to our funerals for believers. You, if, if I die before you lot, and I probably will if the Lord tarries, you come and you have a party. And uh, at my, hey, uh, Mitch, you're going to do the music and you make it joyful like we've had here today. Please. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you will not grieve because you have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For, the, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, a very strong, powerful statement to say, that we are alive and remain until the coming, the rapture, won't precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Speaking to Jews again, so with a shout means something. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, harpazo in the Greek, that's the rapture, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord. And if we read the rest of the scriptures, they go to heaven, they get judged, uh, they have a wedding and they eventually come back onto the earth with Christ prior to the thousand year reign. And he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort yourself. He's coming. This is how it will happen. And he's going to bring your family that died in the Lord, in Christ. They will be rising first. But the, this, with a shout and with the trumpet of God, this touches straight into the heart of the names of the Feast of Trumpets again, okay? Oh, yeah, but how can I be sure? And what about that guy who told me there's the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation? You know, that explains when Christ is coming. and that's, that's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. If Paul needed to tell everybody about a seventh trumpet in Revelation, he'd have told them here. Because they, wouldn't have, they would have known a thing about what G, John is going to teach decades later after Paul. 
Now they knew exactly what Paul's talking about and he wasn't talking about the seventh trumpet in Revelation, the last one of those trumpets. He's talking about the last trumpet as in the feast of trumpets. But it's not dead proof. That was why probably. Here's why definitely it's the feast of trumpets. We go to another passage. 1 Corinthians 15, you know this most of you, I'm sure. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, we will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. And then it begins to describe, you know, perishable, put on the imperishable, mortal, put on immortality, and so on. This is a good thing, amen? (laughs) Death is swallowed up in victory, and so on. Um, But this is at the last trumpet. Now we have a definition technically. Technically we know that in the Jewish idiom, last trumpet is the feast of trumpets. There's a first trumpet, technically, which is Pentecost to the Jews. There is a great trumpet, which is Yom Kippur, the judgment, the great trumpet. And there is the last trumpet. What trumpet is that? The feast of trumpets. Now we've gone beyond probable to definite, in my opinion. What year, though? So we've heard about these uh, Shemitah years, if you've been on YouTube or in Christian circles in the sort of prophecy area. The Shemitah year is the seventh year of a period of years in which the Jews do certain activities where they... um, give uh, cancel debts and stuff like this okay that's a cycle that probably given the way god patterns probably this cycle has been counting in seven years ever since adam right probably seven years seven years seven years seven but the shemitah formal response to the shemitah year only happened when god gave the enlightenment and the rules to Moses to give to the Jews, right? So we don't know. I mean, could Adam have known about the Shemitah? Yeah, maybe he could, but we don't know anything about that. So let's forget that. When it comes into the Bible is when Moses gives it to the nation of Israel, the Shemitah. But we also know something else that I can't take a a rabbit warren journey on, but I would do it if we did this publicly. I would go down a rabbit hole with this and bring it in. That... um, The traditions are that there will be 120 jubilee years from Adam's birth until the return of the second Adam. Now a jubilee year is, depending on who you talk to, 49 or 50 years. 7 times 7 is the 49 and you do the consequences of the things that people do on that 49th year in the 50th year but you also count the year for the next 49 so it's sort of like it's got a 50 year and it's got an overlap that's one theory another theory is no there's no overlap you do 50 years and then you count again 50 years so that you know what they say give two Jews you get four arguments you know um so not blaming anybody but just understand that in all these things this is what I'm now saying we've got to be very cautious people can be very enthusiastic it can all sound great it all ties together but the issue is that they got the dates right and I'm telling you now no one can prove the calendar years of the Jews from Adam they can say them they've got an official year count but I'm telling you now from my research there's no one that has an authority because the records were lost things happened and so on might be right God might have divinely through his Holy Spirit, but we don't know. And it doesn't matter. I'm relaxed. If God wanted us to know, we'd know. In fact, and here's the thing, he may not want us to know. All right? I suggest, given the way I look at all of these things, he gives us enough to know he's working on the pattern and the patterns are going to happen. But we're not quite 100% sure, is it this year? And we don't know. I would suggest. So what I'm saying to you is 120 Jubilee, that that 120 is very important. That's also back in early in the Old Testament scriptures. And so there's this idea that there are 120 Jubilee years. 
and that would add up times 50 to 6,000 exactly. So 120 is a very important number and uh, the 50, it could be 120 times 50 and you don't revert, you know, you have the 49, then you do the 50, then you do the 49, you do the 50 and uh, 50 again, think of it, Pentecost, 50 days, 50 days, so 50 is a very important number as well. So this could very well be correct. If only we knew the year that Adam died. Oh, well, it's easy, is that year one? But I mean, if you understand, in relation to our calendar, Satan has hidden. Satan has made sure that the church themselves would go killing believers who were following the dates of the feasts in order to impose non-Jewish dates on the entire Western church. Who's doing that? Satan's doing that. Satan's doing it so we can't know God's calendar. You see, so there's a war going on in the heavenlies about these things. In 2 Peter 3, 8 to 18, verses 8 to 18, we see this leading in. There were cynics. They were saying things will carry on as they've always carried on. It was like an evolutionary statement, actually. And Peter said, no, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years. Some people like to say that means the six days of creation were a thousand years. But it's totally irrelevant because the context of this is Peter looking forward, not backwards. He's looking prophetically. It's very important. He's looking ahead. And he makes this statement, a day is as a thousand years. Now, obviously, for God, you know, he's, he's not in time. Time is a created facility in our environment. So he's not in time in any way. He's in eternity. And uh, no, this, I believe this word is by the Spirit, and it's for us. And uh, a day is as a thousand years, six days from creation, six thousand years. It's tying up with all the numbers, all the other things, the 120 years, the 50 years for each cycle, six thousand years. I personally have no doubt whatsoever that from Adam to the start of the millennial kingdom is going to turn out when we can have the revelation 6,000 years because he does stuff by patterns because he's God because that's how he designs and has his universe you can go hunting all over this world and find me one thing that hasn't got patterns a rock maths dance chess games cosmology the inside of you Everything is patterned. Everything of evidence you see of God is patterned. And then he's not going to pattern in the Bible? His ultimate evidence of himself? You must be cuckoo. It's going to be patterned to pieces. And I say this because many churches are denying that we should even look. Oh no, you should sit on the surface text. We've come from a good XYZ denomination. And uh, we only do exposition of the surface text. We wouldn't touch that. That is not of God. <laughs> oh my. Oh my. Putting God in a box. The blind leading the blind. Thank God you can get people saved by reading the surface text. Definitely. But if you want any of the deeper things, you're going to go right off track. You've got to be looking at it. It's, it's not Maths 101 anymore. You have to go to algebra. And you have to go to quadratic equations spiritually to get the deeper things of the maths. It's all there. But it all builds. The algebra doesn't deny the simple tables that you learn. And quadratic equations don't deny the algebra or the simple tables. So, you know, what are they panicking about? They're panicking because they're getting out of the comfort zone of what they've learned. Traditions, 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 and so on. No, a day is a thousand years. I suggest that that is something tying in. But when? When is it? Um, I believe if we take... Okay, here's a key thing. What is the day of the Lord? Okay, well, Arnold's done a massive study on the day of the Lord, and he argues that the day of the Lord or the day of Jehovah, you cannot find an instance of that phrase, that term, which is not referring to the time of Jacob's trouble as a whole, not as a piece. Jacob gets really wound up and says, no ways, it's only a part of the seven years, it's the second, the great tribulation three and a half year period. At this point, I favour Arnold for certain reasons, which I'm not going to go into today, it's digressing me too much, but I'd go into it if we did this in a, over four hours. So, 
The day of the Lord, though, from what I can understand, if we allow for the fact that Arnold is correct at the moment, and I think he might be, humbly I say that, it would be from the start of the tribulation to what? Seven years. No, 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 he's not talking about a seven-year period, God. This is a program. He's talking about the day that the Lord takes control right through and read the text to the new heavens. And, P and Peter is using the phrase, the day of the Lord. The Holy Spirit doesn't make errors. When they start putting in phrases, the day of the Lord, it's a specific period governed by God. It's not even the seven-year period. It kicks off. There's definitely, you know, you're looking ahead to the time of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. What is it? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Trouble. Trouble. Which prophets are talking about the day of the Lord? All of them. All of them are talking about. What are, what are they defining when they go into this day of the Lord? Trouble. We've got trouble coming. You're quite right. But there's good news as well. It leads on to what you could view as trouble. A new earth. A new heavens. It's all inside, according to Peter, the day of the Lord right through to the end, the day of the Lord, till he's completely restored the kingdom. And that means the heavens and the earth with fire. Winds it up and lays it out again in a glorified state. And now we have, in the glorified state, millions, Lord willing, maybe billions of, of believers who love the Lord, who cannot sin, have incorruptible bodies, cannot lie, cannot cheat, cannot go against each other, are living, living in a real world, not sitting with a harp on a cloud. Very important. Living in the garden the way Adam was, being blessed, and doing stuff, and being creative, but not trying to make bombs, not trying to get AK-47s anymore. Everything holy. Can you imagine this? We meet and it's holy. Like God's holy. Sure. It's difficult to... Anyway. Uh, so the elements will be destroyed, the new heavens, the new earth. And then Peter rounds all that whole passage off with, because of these things, be holy in conduct and godliness and look for and hasten by your conduct and godliness the coming day of the Lord. That's what Peter was saying. So Shemitah year, I think, yes, it will round on Shemitah years with God doing the counting. 120 jubilee years of 50 years, I think that is correct, but God's doing the counting again. And it will come to 6,000 years from Adam, I think that is correct, because it's six days. Everything is pattern. When God made it, he could have made it in 10 seconds, the world. Why did he do it in six days? He's giving us a pattern from the very beginning that's telling us the end from the beginning. That's why he's doing it. Why did he rest? That was a pattern of tabernacles. We're going to have all this work that we sinned and now we're working evil, working evil, working evil, and then he's going to fix it. Jesus is going to come back, fix it, and the evil is going to stop for a period, and uh, we're going to bring the second Adam onto earth for a thousand years. And then we're going to vindicate the holiness and the love of our God because with Jesus on the earth and all the believers, and he's wiped out all unbelievers, and the believers that survive are having children, they are going to have children that end up disbelieving again. And there's going to be a rebellion. It won't be a single Jew doing this. By an act of the Holy Spirit, every Jew will be faithful down their generations in this period, thousand years of faithfulness. They'll be doing what they should have done back in the previous periods. It's going to happen. But the Gentiles... They are not going to be looking after their children correctly and that's going to build up again a total rebellion. Satan's going to be released to show us. He's going to let him out and look what my people do again. And they're going to turn around and try to wipe out Christ and everybody back in Jerusalem all over again. End of the lessons. <laughs> you know, you've had the flood, you've had Babel, you've had this, you've had AD 70 and so on. End of lessons, end of all the lessons we ever needed to show. Because remember, Adam failed with Satan in the garden. That last lesson, there's no Satan in the garden. He's, been, he's, he's bound for a thousand years, and they still do it without a Satan. That's the last lesson. That will show all angels, all created beings, that it's impossible to live okay without God. You have to have the holy, just, righteous, loving God. And you have to invite him to take hold of you in such a way that you cannot sin. 
Because if we just go to heaven and we can still sin, we're going to sin. We'll be like Satan again. We're going to get it out of your head that we can stop this. Without a total giving to God, freely, in love, in, I don't want to sin. Take away the presence of sin. Take away the power of sin. Take away my desire for sin. Please, Lord, take it away. I don't want the choice of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Take it away and let me be restored how you wanted me in the beginning. And then it's going to be good. It's going to be great. Amen. So the Jewish dates are disputed, I can assure you from my research. There's an unknown day or an hour, but it's on a Feast of Trumpets. It's on a Shemitah year. It'll be a Shemitah that has to be prior, seven years, seven years, seven years. It'll be the seventh Shemitah period with the seventh year in a Jubilee year. That's what's going to happen. Because the patterns, it's like a fruit machine. It's all going to click, 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 click. All the patterns are going to click into place. And it will turn out that that's 6,000 years since Adam. But getting back to imminency, this doctrine of imminency, uh, you know, the reason anyway that uh, rapturing is imminent is because you can die today. And in that sense, in that sense, any of us can meet Jesus as we, 10 minutes after we've gone out of this church service, during this church service. So in that sense, because where would you go? Well, no, scriptures tell us you go straight to the Lord. So the rapture where you get your glorified body won't have happened, but you will have gone straight to the Lord. And in that sense, uh, it, there's an imminency to meeting the Lord, in other words. You understand what I'm saying? We're going to die. If you're a believer, you're going to go straight to meet the Lord. It's a good thing. Scary, but good. And with that, I, I think I'll conclude.